Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Henry Long, and I'm one of your four Athenaeum Fellows for the year. In his 1946 essay, Politics in the English Language, George Orwell laments what he sees as the decadence of the English language and explores how this decay both stems from and contributes to the corruption of political discourse. He writes that political language is used to obscure meaning with euphemisms, to quote, make lies sound truthful and murder respectable. Tonight, like Orwell, Professor John McWhorter will discuss how our political environment continually shapes our language. But unlike Orwell, Professor McWhorter will argue that stable changes in language are an effect rather than a cause of political change. While linguistic descriptivism attempts to describe what language is, linguistic prescriptivism attempts to prescribe what language should be. Professor McWhorter tonight will detail the rise of a new strain of linguistic prescriptivism on the left that seeks to enforce rules about language in order to minimize the possibility of offending certain groups. He will argue that at best, the new prescriptivism is ineffective at producing political change. And at worst, it can hinder effective communication and debate. Professor John McWhorter teaches linguistics at Columbia University as well as Western civilization and music history. He specializes in the relationship between language, race, culture, and politics. He's also the author of The Mishing Spanish Creoles, Language, Simplicity, and Complexity, and The Creole Debate. He has written extensively for Time, The New York Times, CNN, The Wall Street Journal, The New Republic, and elsewhere, and has been a contributing editor at The Atlantic. In addition to his academic work, he has written The Power of Babel, our Magnificent Bastard Tongue, The Language Hoax, Words on the Move, Talking Back, Talking Black, and Nine Nasty Words. His most recent book, the New York Times bestseller Woke Racism, argues that modern anti-racism functions like a religion that hurts black communities and weakens the American social fabric. He's also the co-host of the Lexicon Valley Language Podcast. Tonight, Professor McHorter will deliver the 2023-2024 Valak Family lecture. Earlier today, Professor McWhorter delivered the spring 2024 lecture for the Race Publicus Society speaker series. As someone who attended the talk this lunch, I know firsthand that his lecture was thought-provoking and inspired much lively discussion among the donors. Tonight, if you find yourselves wishing to discuss more about the talk, the Open Academy invites you to a post-Athenaeum discussion in the Center for Writing and Public Discourse immediately following the Q&A this evening. Now at this time, we ask you to please silence your cell phones and direct your attention towards the speaker. As always, video and audio recording are strictly prohibited. Without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor John McCorder. Thank you folks for inviting me, it's wonderful. Being in California, I spent 14 wonderful years here. That was now 22 years ago. I have never stopped missing it. So thank you. Came here on a plane. In any case, what I want to talk to you about, and not for too long, is a certain tendency th that I'm sure we're all used to these days, which is that it's part of being what you could call an enlightened person to feel that you have to watch your terminology to an extent which, especially if you're relatively young, you might not know was not the case even as recently as 10 years ago. Language changes, but these days one must be very careful an awful lot of the time, and we often have a sense that the terms change faster than we can keep up with. And I want to unwrap what a lot of that is about and what it isn't about. And I want to point to a direction for perhaps a more constructive future. And what it comes down to is basically that language changes. There are ways that language changes when society is changing. And that in itself can be a good thing. There's nothing wrong with new terminology emerging. And so, for example, there was a time when it was considered a novelty and by some people kind of annoying to have to say chairperson instead of chairman and chairwoman. I think we've gotten past that, 
and the idea that chairperson discourages you from gendering chairpersonship is something that I think most of us see as progressive. We don't wish that you would go back to specifying whether someone was a chairwoman or a chairman. These things are going to happen. When conceptions of gender roles started changing, then terminology changed. Another example today, perhaps of more immediate concern, is the grand pronoun they and the new way that we're using it to refer to they in the singular to a specific person. And there's a difference between saying, tell each person there that they can come to the party whenever they want to. And they is being used as a singular. That goes back literally to the 1300s. And grammarians have been complaining about it, saying that they is supposed to be plural since the 1700s. That's one thing. But then I'm sure a lot of you know that there's a different they today. The different they today is my friend is over there and they want to see you. And you're talking about that friend. My cousin is in the basement and they're coming upstairs right now as opposed to he or she is coming upstairs right now. That's new, that's different. Roberta is cutting their nails. And you know that she's not cutting several people's nails. It, it's what I would most immediately call her nails. That is a new usage of they. And you know, if you're of a certain age, which of course I'm not, but if you're of a certain age, and I'm very much of a certain age, you can find that a difficult thing to wrap your head around because pronouns are very deeply seated. But younger people don't find it a problem. And there's nothing wrong with it because we do have evolving conceptions of gender these days. And you would expect, what you wouldn't expect is for it not to happen. You would expect for use of terms, even including pronouns, to happen. That, that's fine. But there's something else happening these days that is, in my view, worrisome. And it's worrisome because it doesn't help people. It's proposed as a way of helping people, but it doesn't actually. And that is prescribing that language changes before thought and assumptions in society have moved in that particular direction. Many people are telling us that in order to change the way people think, you have to change the way people talk. And that can sound unexceptionable. That can sound perfectly rational. But the truth is, that doesn't actually work. And that's been pretty resoundingly proven over a great deal of time. And it's easy to miss, but it means that all of these new terms and expressions that we're being told to use out of a sense that if we use them, we'll think differently and that this will be a pathway to social justice, it's not very effective. And the reason it's not effective is because it is imposed in neglect of certain realities about language that can be difficult to perceive. There are two main issues that one should carry away given this sort of thing. One of them is somewhat mundane. One of them involves learning to put on a different set of glasses. I'm going to give you the mundane one first. Many of these new terms are embraced wholeheartedly by a certain group of people. Roughly, you could say that it's one part academics, one part activists, and one part artists. A beautiful example of that is Latinx for people who used to be referred to as Latino collectively. And so it was about 10 years ago, I think, that I had a student who wrote a paper for me about Latinx, which I had not heard of. And I thought this is an interesting proposal, the idea being to take the gender implication out of the word Latino and to have it be gender neutral. And the idea is to impose the X suffix in many places in the language. So social justice, we get away from the gender binary. And in a language like Spanish, where the gender binary is so evident, because you use that alternation between masculine O and feminine A so often, why not mask that and replace it with something neutral like X? Or to the extent that there's some arbitrary aesthetic problems with X, it doesn't sound good, you might use E. And so Latine is what some people are using. Now, there's nothing wrong with proposing that. But the problem with it is, 
that to say, okay, we wish to not think about the gender binary and so we're gonna use this suffix, is, and the data are in, something that very, very few Latinx people wish to use. And so it's one thing to read it in certain places, it's one thing to hear it in certain contexts, and that's great. But really, you could put it in kind of mundane terms, almost no Latino people use the term Latinx. You wouldn't know it in academia, in academia, you wouldn't know it in the arts, you wouldn't know it in certain activist circles, but in the real world of most people who are Latino, it has no traction, it's considered one, aesthetically unpleasant, and two, imposed by people from somewhere else, and three, kind of a downer. The truth is, for better or for worse, most people, and that includes most Latino people, don't want to have the gender binary eliminated from consciousness to that extent. I'm just stating a fact. And so, survey after survey has shown that only about 3% of Latinos want that term. Now, that in itself is fine. It means that there will be a small set of people who prefer to use that term. There's nothing wrong with jargon. What Latinx is, is jargon. It has become a jargon that takes its place alongside all sorts of other jargons that all sorts of groups of human beings always have. Jargon is natural. I was teaching a class the other day where we talked about jargon. But this is the thing. Latinx was developed as a way of creating social justice of changing the way people think about things, of making a better world. If only 3% of Latino people use it, what kind of social justice is happening? And so you could argue that you want to change thought, which is slower and harder. If you want to make people stop thinking about the gender binary, there are all sorts of ways that you can talk about things, discuss things. You can be new things. You can show new things. But to change a suffix, and to bristle if people aren't using the suffix with you, it might not be productive. There's another example of this. I am sure, nobody can quite figure out exactly who did it, but somebody made up BIPOC, this, this new term, and it gets around B-I-P-O-C, and it's supposed to be a term that refers to a certain aggregation of people. It's um, black, indigenous, and then people of color. Now, many people think of that as a very useful term to distinguish all of the people I just referred to from white people. The intention is clear. The idea is to maybe foster a sense among black, indigenous, and people of color of a group consciousness that can work against discrimination from the white hegemony. That's completely understandable. But BIPOC has problems. You know, some terms make it, some don't. African American, those of you who are under a certain age cannot imagine how odd that sounded in 1989. It happened in like two days. You were black one day, Jesse Jackson got on TV, and all of a sudden somebody is calling you African American. And I'm thinking, I'm from Nigeria, but it became it became widespread very quickly. It's a little weird, but it's catchy. It had good intentions. It was pushed by the proper people, and it happened very quickly. Oriental to Asian was very similar. One day, you said Oriental as a very progressive person. Next day, everybody around you was saying Asian. I remember when it was. It was, it was the spring of 1987, Asian. Boom. Well, it works. There was something pleasantly global about the term Asian. Oriental sounded kind of like it referred to food. It was time for something else. BIPOC is not one of these cases. It's confusing because it sounds like it's referring to bisexuals, and it's just an accident, but it's not. Did you know that it's not bisexuals and then pox? It's supposed to be black, indigenous. It's not about bisexuals. And then, you know, it ends in a k, k. Things aren't supposed to end in k if they're going to be euphonious. African American, for example, Asian, BIPOC. If you work for a naming company, which I did for about six torturous months, you learn that things that get around aren't supposed to end in k. 
Toyota 4Runner, Velveeta, BIPOC. It's unpleasant. And that's partly why, and for any of you who embrace the term, I apologize, but frankly, this, this is true. It has an unpleasant sound that makes it seem as if you're talking about some sort of unpleasant medical condition. It's something that you suffer from. I have BIPOC. And so, <laughs> it really is. And so it's not catching on and it's not going to and the surveys are the same way. Now, I completely understand why you might want to create a sense of coalition between people who are black, people who are indigenous, although Latinos don't like being called indigenous for the most part, and then people of color, whoever exactly that's supposed to refer to. If all of those people are supposed to think of themselves as a group working against white discrimination and white power, that's good. But the thing is, if only a very few people are going to use BIPOC beyond a certain setting, how is it helping to forge that coalition? There are many ways of arguing for that kind of coalition, and goodness, it would be an uphill climb. But to decide that there's going to be a term that will make people think that way, it's not the most effective way of creating social justice if nobody uses the term. So the first problem is that some of these terms that are being imposed are only used by a very small number of people. And that small number of people constitute a tiny subset of the people that supposedly are going to be helped by this. That's a problem. Now, that's one thing. That's relatively meat and potatoes, or veal and, and mashed potatoes. But suppose we talk about something else, which is a misimpression that I think a lot of activists are working under that they can't help because the media fosters this. And that is an idea that our words channel the way that we think. If you change the words, then you'll change the way people conceive of the world around them. Where this comes from is one brilliant, but frankly, slightly eccentric and rather misled person who died too young to have to defend himself named Benjamin Lee Worf. He had a hypothesis in the 1930s that now goes under the name often of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Worf studied the Hopi Native American language and he was interested in the differences between Hopi and English. And he noticed certain things such as that in Hopi it happens that the word for water if you're drinking it is different from the word for water if it's in a pond or something like that. There are two different words for water. And he was thinking, well, that must mean that they perceive water differently than we in this room perceive water because we think of water as being both in the ocean and in a glass. And he had all sorts of interesting ideas about how Hopi people think and what the Hopi language is like. And you know, the truth was that he, he, wasn't, he didn't have to be a linguist and you don't have to be a linguist to have excellent ideas about language, but he wasn't a linguist. He was a fire inspector who occasionally looked at Hopi. And I'm not sure why this is, because he, he lived shortly, but he didn't really ever learn Hopi that well. And almost everything that he said about it happened not to be accurate, but he had this charismatic idea about how your language channels your thought. And the truth is that it's been shown over the almost 100 years since he came up with this idea that language does channel thought to a tiny, tiny extent. But it doesn't channel thought to such an extent that people walk around looking at the world through different glasses. And that's something that's been shown again and again and again. So there are many people who are teaching us that we want to use different terminology because it'll make us think differently, led, even if they haven't read the original documents, it's just an idea that's in the air, by this idea originally promulgated by this fire inspector in the 1930s. And the truth is, you can look at the Worfian idea and tell that it couldn't really be true if you just pull the lens back and look at lots of languages. And I'm not going to make you do that, but there is, for example, this one. This is one of the most interesting ones. If you are speaking Chinese, if you're speaking Mandarin, then there are things that you don't have to do that you have to do in English that can throw you a little bit. And so, for example, if I said to you, um, if you saw my sister, you would know 
that she's pregnant. Okay, if you saw my sister, you would know that she's pregnant. I could also say, if you had seen my sister, you would have known she was pregnant. Now, in English, I have to make those distinctions. So, for example, if you had seen my sister, you would have known she was pregnant. In Mandarin, the way that you say both of those sentences is basically, if you see my sister, you know she's pregnant. The context takes care of all the rest. To say, if you had seen my sister, you would have known she was pregnant. There's no way to put it exactly that way in Mandarin. We think of it as natural in English because European languages are very picky about things like the conditional past. But that's picky in languages. If you fly around the world and you try to figure out how people are going to say, if you had X, you would have this. It almost never comes out as precise as the way you do it in languages on a peninsula of Asia that's called Europe. Now, we can't help thinking of that as normal because we're fish that don't know we're wet. But Chinese is, frankly, a normal language. You don't have to be that precise because the context is always there. Now, that could be taken to mean, under this Worfian idea that what you say channels what you think, that could be taken to mean that if you're a Chinese speaker, you're not as sensitive to the conditional and the hypothetical as people who are pickier about it. After all, in English, we're channeled to look at these exact currents of the conditional past. If you're speaking Mandarin, you're not. So that must mean that you're not feeling that as much. Now, none of us will believe for a second that to be Chinese is to be less sensitive to the counterfactual than an English speaker. And there was this one poor man who actually did do a study where he argued that to be Chinese must be to be less sensitive to the counterfactual. And people have been shooting after him with a BB gun in the academic press ever since then. He did the first paper right around when Ronald Reagan was elected. People are still writing papers in response. I don't know if he's even still alive. And that's because the idea doesn't work. That's not how Warfianism goes. And examples like this go on and on. I'll give, you, I'll give you one more to show you how careful we have to be about this. In French, there's no way to say something sticks out. So if you are, you're driving, I don't know why I'm using this example, but you're driving a rental car and you're in a hurry and all the cars are in a line and you go and you park your car but you go and you don't park it quite right and you go to the office and you say, I'm sorry, but my car is kind of sticking out. In French, you have to say, I didn't park my car quite right. That gets it across. There is no way to say it sticks out in French. It's just a chance thing. English has it. French doesn't. And those of you who are French speakers, notice, the only thing you can say is that you didn't do it right. It's, it's wrongly parked, but not there's that thing over there that's sticking out like a finger. I can't say it. Now, do we really believe that the French don't understand sticking outness? They understand it as well as we do. It's just that the language has a little dip in it, just as English has various dips that we don't think of because we are fish who don't know we're wet. Now, that may have seemed like a digression, but it kind of wasn't because that idea that what you say channels what you think underlies why we're being told to say a lot of the things that we are. And so, for example, there'll be an idea that you don't wish to call anyone a bum or a tramp. And so, long time ago now, we stopped saying that, and well, understandably, and it was changed to homeless person, okay, because that seems to be a kinder way of thinking of the bum and the tramp. But today, the same pejorative feelings that unfortunately had amassed on bum and tramp have become attracted to homeless person as well. It's no longer the gentle euphemism that it was 40 years ago. And so now there are people who are telling us that we should say that there are unhoused people or people who are without homes. The idea being that that will take us away from conceiving of homeless people the way we might or the way some people might because we're using a different term. But the problem is that language doesn't work that way. You can't make people think differently by changing the word. Rather, the thoughts that are attracted to a particular term at a given time, if you take the term away, those thoughts just fly towards the new term. 
And after a generation, you need a new one. The Worfian idea doesn't work because language and meaning don't walk in the lockstep that we often think that they do. The words that we use, the expressions that we use, the dictionary definitions of the words don't march in lockstep with the meanings that accrue to them. And so there was a time when people would talk openly about slum clearance. This is first half of the 20th century. So this is a blighted area. We're going to get rid of the blight. And so we're going to have slum clearance. And that was thought of as a polite way of referring to what before was get all those people out of there. It became slum clearance. Well, it was obvious what was being done. It was getting all those people out of there. And so starting in the 50s, there was a new term, urban renewal. That's, a, that's pretty clever, actually. We're going to renew the herb. And you're kind of talking around that you're talking about you know, knocking buildings down and not caring where people live, et cetera. So for a while, urban renewal, you know, Robert Moses, all of this sounded kind of better. That lasted about 10 minutes. People were screaming and laughing and r r hating urban renewal by the late 60s. And so in that case, people then started just not talking about it very much because it was clear that a term wasn't going to work. But that is something that's called the euphemism treadmill. It is that if you change the word, in about a generation, you're going to have to change it again. The Worfian idea just doesn't go through. And so two problems. One, a lot of these terms only end up being used by a very few people and not the ones who need help. And two, if you change the word before the thoughts themselves are changed, then the word doesn't stick. And it's very hard to get past that. But if those two things are realities, then there are three things that we have to think about in terms of this terminology that's coming from certain places. And this is very important to realize. It used to be that ideas as to how we're supposed to talk and how we're supposed to write often came not from the left, but from people who are often accused of wanting to control from above. And so the idea that you're supposed to say fewer books rather than less books, or you're supposed to say the person who brought me in, but then there's the book which I read and how you decide whether to use that or which, all of these rules that you're often taught were things that people on the left tended to deride as something coming from those who wish to control, from those who wish to preserve classism, from those who wish to preserve hierarchy. Now we're having the same kind of words imposed, not by people from there, but from the hard left, with what they regard as intentions as good as people who used to impose rules like you cannot use they in the singular. That actually, it turns out, was it was a, a woman in the 1830s, the first person who said that that was not to be done. And she just made it up. She just thought, well, I don't like it. So they is supposed to be used in the, in, in the plural. It's just something she said, and then she disappeared. And here we are, stuck with it. That's how arbitrary these rules are. But now we're getting it from a different part of the political spectrum. And there are three things that we need to think about. One, as this happens, we can't reflexively resist anything that comes along. Words change sometimes because thoughts are changing as well. And that's natural. That's the way that any language breathes. I personally feel that the new they is one of those things, for example. That's normal. Or young women are calling each other you guys and dude. There are people who find that really disturbing. They think that it means that these women are erasing their femininity or they are promoting masculinity as the default. No, it's not that. It's that over the past several decades, our sense of gender roles has certainly not gotten where we want it to go, but it's changed far enough that the word guys is no longer gendered the way it used to be. When young women say, come on, you guys, let's go, they're not thinking of themselves as men. They're thinking of themselves as people. That's because society has, has changed. 
Women didn't call each other dude when I was in my teens, and that's because that process hadn't happened yet. If we had come into the future and watched young people, one, with something in their pockets they call a phone, and then two, calling each other dude, we would have been utterly mystified. It would have been science fiction. That's because there's been progress on that. And then a second thing is to realize that some of these terms, if they feel a little odd outside of certain circles, they're not wrong. It's not wrong to say Latinx. People are going to keep doing that. Some of them. Not anybody in my neighborhood in Queens, where most people are Latino, I haven't heard the word once, and I can just tell that if I used it with most people in the neighborhood, they would, they would laugh at me, they'd throw jelly beans at me, they don't believe in that word. But it's okay if people use it on college campuses, it's okay if people use it in certain circles. I think, for example, many people are deeply offended by the term, um, what is it? Um, um, birthing people. And so instead of woman, you're a birthing person because under our new conceptions, somebody who identifies as a man can give birth. These are hard things to wrap your head around. There's nothing necessarily wrong with them, though. And to tell you the truth, no offense to anyone, but no, nobody is going to say birthing person beyond certain circles at this point. Now, it can be uncomfortable to be made to, there's a little bit of a, a, a fine line. But to see it in documentation, let them use that term. Very few people are ever going to. There's nothing wrong with jargon. And that's what some of those things are. But where something is not going to stay between the lines, so to speak, I think that we need to learn to speak more explicitly about the reality that words very quickly slip beyond what their dictionary definitions are. And we have to think of that as ordinary and make it clear in our discussions of certain things, because our discussions can often go wrong out of a sense that the dictionary tells us what words mean, combined with the idea that our words and our expressions channel what our thoughts are. And so, for example, um, these days there is a huge debate over diversity, equity, and inclusion policies. And the public debate over how one feels about what's called DEI is extremely, well, one, high-pitched, but then more to the point, it's muddy because diversity and equity and inclusion are words that are in the dictionary, and they have certain meanings in the dictionary. But the thing is, words like that, especially when they're used a lot and about interesting things, we can assume that they're not being used in their dictionary meanings, and that therefore someone is being unfair. It's not good play to say that if you don't like the way DEI policies are being administered, it means that you don't like diversity or equity or inclusion. It comes down to that everywhere in a language, just it's looking behind every little corner, the way you use a word is not what the dictionary says. So for example, give you a quick little fragment. They bonded. They bonded. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that they went and took something and stuck it to something else? No. Does it mean that they physically bound themselves together for some reason? No. They bonded. It means that they found a certain sense of connection. It's a relatively new term. I doubt if anybody said it before about 1970. They bonded. Now, would you find that in a dictionary unless it was one of the really thorough ones? No. The dictionary meaning of bond is if I take this and I take this, please don't spill, and I go like that. But that's not what bond means in our heart of hearts. Or to take another term, welfare. Okay. Whatever we all thought is not going to be what's the first definition in the dictionary because words almost always semantically narrow, as we call it. Welfare, I can work to think that welfare means somebody's well-being. I have probably never used it that way in my life except in irony because the word has narrowed to refer to a social program. Same thing with DEI. And so, for example, the diversity in DEI, like it or dislike it, the program I mean, the diversity does not refer to the multifarious. That's not 
what it means. The diversity really refers specifically mostly to black, Latino, and Native American people. Now, that is a whole discussion that one can have, but that's a narrower meaning of diversity than what anybody would have recognized before about 1978. Now, no one is against diversity, nobody of any matter in, in our times. A hundred years ago, probably most people in this room would have been against diversity. We've made progress on that. However, how you achieve the diversity and for who, it's, it's controversial. And it's controversial among people who we would consider legitimate moral actors. And so, there's diversity in the dictionary, but then there is this narrowed meaning of diversity where questions might emerge, especially over the passage of time. Equity. I don't know what the dictionary says equity means. It's something like equality. But with DEI programs, what equity refers to is a quota approach that you feel that certain people should be represented uh, to a certain degree in certain positions. You may be for that, you may be against it, especially the way it's done. You might be somewhere in the middle, but it doesn't mean that you're against equity. You're against what equity means within the confines of how DEI operates within our times over about the past 10 years. Inclusion, no one's against inclusion, but the issue is whether this inclusion is enforced by changing our conceptions of what qualifications mean. And that's very controversial. There are intelligent arguments for assessing whether what we call qualifications are worthwhile. For example, assessing whether the SAT is a valuable measure for whether people should be admitted to a school. One must talk about those things. However, it's a position that one can take in many places. And the idea that you change what qualifications are will depend partly on for what reason and for who. These are rich issues. And so for someone to say, I don't like DEI these days, and for the opponent to say, you're not for diversity, equity, and inclusion, well, then that means that you don't like the direction that this country has taken since roughly 1863. You're against people who are not white gaining a representation within our channels of power. No, that's not the way it works, and not just because that's an impolite way of having a discussion, but because a person might make that accusation actually thinking on the one hand, knowing that they're living in this world within which DEI programs are operated in a certain way, but then thinking about language and about the labels of things in a different kind of a way. There's probably a fine line between using that as a rhetorical technique and being confused about how words work. But it is a major obstacle to having these kinds of conversations. Are you against diversity? No one is. The issue is the narrower meaning of diversity. And so my point is that there is this um, this new imposition of terms with a degree of proliferation that can be somewhat dazzling. And in some cases, I think that it's harmless. But in other cases, I think we have to understand that what's going on is an application of this Worfianism by people who don't understand that the sad thing is that in order to change how people think, you have to change how people think. You have to make arguments, you have to be prepared to get pushback, you have to craft your arguments carefully, and you have to understand that these things happen slowly. I think there is a wish, especially since 2020, to change things by leveling a term, and so saying that you don't say that somebody is an earthquake victim, you say that there's someone who's experienced an earthquake because you don't want to associate people too intimately with their victimhood. All you have to do is change that word and you can change thought relatively quickly or at least it's easy to make the proposal because you're just saying to change a word as opposed to crafting the kind of argumentation that might actually have a result. And this is the important thing and to the extent that I have any wisdom to give as somebody who is marching quickly towards being elderly to people who are younger, I would say it is easier to believe that change doesn't happen than to acknowledge that it happens slowly. 
I get that from somebody else. But that is very important counsel. This kind of change happens slowly, but goodness, it does happen. And I'm 58, that's how elderly I am, just old enough to be able to realize that it does happen because I've gotten to the age. Once you're in your 50s, you start to realize that you knew as an adult what was a completely different time. You start to realize how change actually happens. And really, it's about change happening slowly. You can't push it. You're not going to make it happen faster by changing words and, frankly, by giving people a hard time for using the wrong ones. It's very easy to believe that change doesn't happen. It's a great rhetorical score. But the thing is, change does happen. It just happens slowly. You have to wait until you're 58. But believe me, it's worth it. So those are my words about the onslaught of directives about language of late. And now I want you to ask me questions about them so that I can have a swig of water. And so let's pass on to the question session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your talk, Professor McWhorter. We'll now move on to the Q&A portion of the evening. So if you have a question for Professor McWhorter about the talk, please line up against one of the two walls. We'll be alternating between the mics. Um, the Q&A will go into 8 p.m. and Professor McWhorter needs to leave at 8 p.m. sharp uh, to catch a flight. So please keep your questions brief, uh, roughly one to two sentences. And before you do your question, please just introduce yourself, say your name, um, what school you're from, what Adrian? grade you're in. Adrian, can I be a, a primo uomo? I love ice water. It is my favorite thing other than black olives. Can I have, because this is nice, but can I have ice water, please? I need it. I'm about to, I'm about to get on a plane. So. I also like sausage. as long as it's cold. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Here, we'll just leave this up here. Please, please. yes. Hmm. Hello, Professor. Thank you Hello, for the talk. Here. It was very informative. Um, I have a question about um, the talk and about using, um, you know, the application of of uh, suggesting that people use different terminology or, or or words in a different meaning, and the degree to which that can assert change or or suggest change. Um, do you believe that there's any component of being able to like assert these sort of changes of of usage of words that could um, affect this change by um, you know the the people who then hear that these proposals for, for changing terminology to, to then think about what the reasons for for those sorts of changes being made might exist which then you know leads them to consider those sorts of arguments sort of as a proxy um, maybe in addition to or or in parallel to um, those arguments you know being made and to, to convince um, to convince people through the through the manner that you are describing you know, I'm not trying to be a pill in saying that I understand the idea that maybe you can do both, but honestly, until the thoughts have changed, I'm not sure if there's a point. And so certainly you don't say, we're going to say it this way and then I'm going to make some arguments. But to make some arguments and say, we're going to say it this way is difficult because the, the thoughts are going to change slowly. And if people are using the term in a kind of fright, then eventually you're going to have to replace the term anyway. And so the question becomes, why change it? And so for example, homeless. Yes, there are people who now see that term as having a certain aroma upon it. And so others will say, we're going to come up with new terms. But wouldn't it be better? This kind of reflects a little bit of the conversation we had at the table, to work on the housing problem in this country and work on our conception of why people are without houses. I'm not sure 
this is a perfect example of, of what you're saying. I'm not sure it would make sense now to say, first of all, we're going to say people without housing, and we're also going to work on what's going on in, in, in San Francisco. I would rather only do the one. I, I completely take your point, though. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Ariel. I first of all, I enjoyed your talk. I'm a freshman at Pitzer College, um, perspective environmental analysis or geology major. Um, and I just, you brought up the point about DEI, and I just kind of thought back and I thought maybe that would lead into talking about CRT, critical race theory, because it's such a hot topic also these days. Um, and I was just wondering, like, I'm from the Chicago area, so we kind of, like, a li very liberal area, and we learned about it in English, like, ways to analyze text through CRT. Um, senior year of high school, and I was just wondering, like, what your opinions are about that, or what you kind of like thoughts about like those words. Just yeah. Um, yeah, I mentioned CRT earlier this afternoon, but I felt there was a little drag there, and so I didn't do, I didn't do it during the talk because I figured somebody would ask, and so thank you. Yes, <laughs> um, critical race theory is a great example of what I'm talking about in that it starts with these very interesting papers that a few legal scholars wrote starting in the late 70s. I only know of it from the 80s, but apparently the, the late 70s. And then you get the acronym CRT, and then you get a debate over whether CRT is being taught in schools, which it's, it's not. Nobody is assigning Kimberly Crenshaw's papers in schools. But there is a general ideology that's filtered down from the work of Crenshaw and Patricia Williams and Richard Delgado and Regina Austin. These are fascinating papers, but the problem is that whatever is in those papers, what leaks out of them is a general set of attitudes. And one of them is a basic sense that whiteness is a bad thing for which if you are cursed with it, you should always feel guilty. And many people would consider that to be God's wisdom, but many people wouldn't. And then there is a general idea that what our society considers achievement and qualification to be should be completely reordered to adjust for hierarchy in society. And intelligent and moral people will differ on how you, how you accomplish that. And then something else that you get from those writings, sometimes directly, sometimes not, is a sense that all of this must be enforced with a kind of almost recreational punitiveness that you have to really, if I may, burn that mother down. And to use the real up-to-date slang. And so those things are questionable to most people. And so the idea is not whether you think that the intersectionality idea makes sense. It's not to question whether there is hierarchy in our society that's unfair, but it's how you address it. And when people say CRT is not being taught in schools, they're playing a kind of a game, because what people mean by CRT, the word has changed. It's moved away from what its original meaning was, and it has tended to confuse discussion. Thank you. You're welcome, Ariel. Hi there. My name is Sam Goldfein. I'm a senior at CMC majoring in Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. I wanted to go back to a point that you made at the beginning, um, talking about how although different languages tend to have uh, various words that refer to different ideas that don't always exist across languages, that we actually think very similarly uh, across different languages. and um, well, from my own personal experience and also from talking with other of my friends who are bilingual or know other languages, they oftentimes express that they have different personalities in different languages, um, different senses of humor, different ways of processing emotions or talking with their friends or family. And I was curious if, um, yeah, how that kind of plays into not thinking differently in different languages yet still acting differently. Is that purely just a direct relationship to culture differences or uh, I don't know how you would explain that? Um, there are two answers, and um, one of them that some people think I should give is that languages do give you different personalities. There are some people who really swear by that, who are truly bilingual in languages, which, which I am not. They say that. To be honest, I think that what you're referring to is real, but that's because of 
the person's experiences as somebody who is at home versus somebody who is out in the world and in school, et cetera. Those are going to be different people, and therefore you're going to be different people in those languages, but it's not about the languages. And so let's say that you grow up in my neighborhood, Jackson Heights in Queens, you speak Dominican Spanish at home, you speak English outside. You're going to say Spanish is a warmer language because that's the language of home. English is kind of cold, but if you were in the Dominican Republic and you were speaking English at home and Spanish outside, I'm quite sure that people would say the opposite thing. So it's not about the language, it's about what you happen to have done with it. Um, I say that as somebody who was raised with you know, just this boring English, but that is the impression I have from watching a bunch of people. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Adarsh. I'm an environment, economics, politics major at Claremont McKenna. Thank you so much for the speech. Um, I had a question about, uh, let me try to phrase this. Um, so I'm curious, given your experience, what are methods you think that activists who believe language should be changed what are methods that you think have been successful more than the punitive approach that you think doesn't work? Uh, and I'm also curious, since you did mention that words like African and American were also sort of unilaterally opposed all of a sudden, um, do you think they generated as much reactance and backlash as we see today with the imposition? And why were they ultimately successful? Well, this is the thing. They weren't. And so the story goes that there was Negro for a while that was considered to have accreted certain associations. And so then black comes in in the late 60s with, for about 10 minutes, Afro-American. But for some reason, that never caught on. And so black. And then black changes to African-American. And if we think that there are negative stereotypes attached to black people, hasn't changed, and African-American didn't help. And so today, there is a movement to come up with some other term. And it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Some people are going back to black. We have an idea that you use the ADOS acronym to refer to native black people who have roots in slavery in the United States versus black people who are children of immigrants. And all of that is because that imposition, as noble in intent as Jesse Jackson was, didn't change the thoughts. And so that, that's one of the answers to the question. And in terms of changing the thoughts, to the extent that racist thought is not today what it was in the past. And I know some people disagree, but well, I will still say there's been a lot of change. You have to go back to the past to realize it. Well, that's taken a lot of argumentation. That's taken an awful lot of suasion that's taken an awful lot of letting things simmer, but language doesn't seem to have helped much. And if anything, sometimes it's tended to hinder it. So that's my answer to that question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, my name is Lola. I'm a freshman at Scripps, although I think you're supposed to say first year. Um, my question is, so you, you mentioned that, you know, now girls and women use the term dude and guys, whereas terms like BIPOC and Latinx haven't caught on. What do you think is the difference between those sorts of terms that catch on and terms that don't? Well, with um, the dude and the you guys, it happened after thought had changed. And so the language came in to express the sense one has of being a young girl now as opposed to 50 years ago. Whereas BIPOC is something some people sat in a room and came up with thinking we need that term to encourage something to happen that hasn't happened. So if that kind of coalition happened, then spontaneously there would be a sense, we need a name for this new group of, of brown people rising up from the bottom. I don't think it would be BIPOC, but there'd be, there'd be something else. But it's the cart before the horse problem that Freshman is wrong now? Yeah, because it's men. Because it's freshmen. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad to learn this. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, first year. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lucy. I'm a sophomore at CMC, but I'm studying writing over at Scripps. 
Um, my question is about, you talked a lot about words that are changing their, like the, the actual word itself is changing, but the definition is not. And I was kind of curious about words that are hoping to change their meaning without the actual word changing itself, like certain communities that are hoping to like reclaim words that were once used in derogatory ways. Do you think that's possible without actually changing the word that was used? Hmm. I don't put those two things together. That's very, that's very interesting. So you mean the way slurs are reclaimed? In order yeah, like, to... excuse my language, but I do think like lots of like girls in like middle and high school say like bitch in like a friendly way to their friends. I have <laughs> definitely heard that. Yeah, it is, um, it is, I've actually seen that used, a, a young woman walked up to a woman, a woman and a guy and said, hey, and I, and I remember thinking that's really changed. It is, it is perfectly natural for human beings to t it's a very ordinary pathway of language change to hear a slur and to reach out for it as a way of social leveling in the in-group. This is something we're all thinking of a certain example that begins with N, and it didn't start with hip hop. You find that in the 1700s. It would be surprising if black people hadn't adopted the word in that way. And you find interesting interviews around the turn of the century where Educated, intelligent, and influential black people are having debates over whether it's okay to use coon and darky in that same way. It's just, it's natural. And so, you can see other examples such as the B word, where that is, you would almost expect it. The lesbian D word is the same thing. That's something that people do. It's based on a normal way of thinking. The Italian peasant who calls his friend Paisan, the Russian coal miner who calls his friends Mujik, which basically means kind of like a white guy a generation back drinking a beer and saying, hey, you bastard, bastards, let's have some drinks. That's what, that's what Mujik means. That is, <laughs> that is perfectly normal. So, I'm all in favor of that because it's based on a human feeling that's always there. The way that you feel comfortable with people is leveling, where you can call each other names, you can get intoxicated, and language ends up coming along with that. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi there, my name is Elisa, and I'm a freshman at CMC. Your first year. First yeah. year. <laughs> well, we're not scripts, so I don't know. But, um, um, just, <laughs> that wasn't meant to be controversial. <laughs> um, anyways, my question is regarding the intersection of language and the change of language and technology. So being a young woman, I've noticed that many of us tend to take lingo from the internet and interpolate it in our daily conversations, no matter what it be, and whether this be people using euphemisms for words that are banned on TikTok or Instagram or just memes that get promulgated throughout our culture, we tend to use the internet in the real life very, very much. I'm interested in your opinion on how thoughts change in regards to the internet um, and how language is changing as a result of it, if it's going to change in the long term as a result or if it's just these micro fads that we're seeing. Um, because in my perspective, I think as much as the internet can bring people together and show differences and create a progressive idea of different words and different languages, it can also polarize and very much so. So my question is regarding the timeliness and the length to which language will change as a result of the the internet. Can you give me an example of what you're talking about? Um, so I'm, so, I'm so far from it, but I think, <laughs> I think I know what you mean, but give me an example. Gosh, I'm... This internet language. Okay. A really good example is the fact that you can't say certain forms of the word dead or killed on TikTok because those words will be banned. Um, so people say unalive instead. Oh, this. Okay. Yes. Are, you, are, you, are you talking about this algo speak? Uh, yes. 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 <laughs> if I know what you're talking about, because I have a student who was telling me about this, you end up creating all of these euphemisms because you don't yes. want, right. That's becoming this sort of lingo of its own. It seems to me that that is something that makes people in that community feel like a community. It ends up becoming, it's not a specific jargon because a lot of it is certain techniques of 
disguising the words, although some of them end up becoming basically words of their own. You're creating a lingo. It's a, it, it's a jargon. It makes people feel like a group. It's the same thing in a way, although it's not what they intended, as saying Latinx or BIPOC. And so I think that that's fine. From what I hear, some of that, though, can be kind of abusive because what you're, the words that you're distorting are things that are mean to people as well that would have gotten to, am I, am I projecting? I think that can be seen. Yeah. Some of that. And so that's a whole different kind of issue. But let's face it, human beings can be kind of mean. And meanness can be part of what jargon, unfortunately, is for, if we're going to be kind of gimlet-eyed about these things. And so that's my guess as to what you mean based on my one student who's told me about that. Um, ask me again in like a year, and I'll, I'll probably know, know a little bit more. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Henry. I'm a junior at CMC. Um, you discussed a little bit about how the left used to assail the right, or mostly conservatives and elites, for ascribing the rules and grammar laws of language, and how these roles have now largely changed in recent years. I was wondering if you think this is due to a class realignment in politics or a cultural shift that we've experienced, and which you might lean more towards. Um, that's a very good question. A lot of the language peeves out there, like I can't stand it when somebody puts a preposition at the end of a sentence, or I can't stand it when people use so at the beginning of a sentence, et cetera. No offense to anybody in this room, because those peeves are very common among people of all political persuasions. But, you know, it's interesting with so. If you listen to people on radio shows and things, they don't say so yet, but they use well just as much. It, it changed randomly. Did you know that men say huh and women say hmm more? Did you ever think about that? That's how subconscious language is. I'm rambling. Anyway, so the point, <laughs> the point is that a lot of that honestly is, and I have to tread, let, let me put it in the past. A lot of that is the last permissible classism. And so for people who would never say, well, darling, you can't marry him. He's just a postal worker. You can still say that person is kind of lowly because they put so at the head of their sentences, et cetera. And I think that that kind of classism is being eaten away at in modern society. I think that we are a less classist America than we were even in 1980 through gradual suasion. And so, for example, this is becoming an old reference, but there is a British sitcom from the 1980s and 90s called Keeping Up Appearances. And it was absolutely hilarious. And it was about this woman who would here be middle, middle class, who has aspirations to be somebody who is affluent culturally. And in Britain, that works. Every second sentence is about her class pretensions. That's the kind of Britcom that usually gets made in an American version. Nobody's ever tried to do it here because the joke wouldn't work. We don't think about class that way, or we pretend that class doesn't exist in a way that people on the Windy Island, which one is Windy? Well, one of those islands do. And so I think that it's a sign that we're moving on. Now, those things are still there, but it's, it's interesting. It's partly because of the internet. How people felt about those sorts of things in 1990 versus how they feel now, things are really changing. There's been, I shouldn't mention cracks in the ice because it makes me think about climate change, but there have been cracks in the ice. And so, for example, in the year 1995, there was something new called the internet. And I joined something called a chat group. And I was writing about something, and someone wrote to me this screed. You're supposed to be a college professor. You absolutely cannot say things like less books instead of fewer books. You've really got to straighten yourself out. That wouldn't happen now. It would be much less likely. But that took almost 40 years. So yeah, that's what I think about that. We are less classist than we used to be. We're still classist. But there is a realignment in that way. But notice that there's almost a human desire to want to put people down for not having gotten the message. And so we get a lot of that from other quarters instead. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
Hi, I'm Jasper, and I'm a Hi, first year here at ZMC. <laughs> um, so my question, like Elisa's, has to do with the internet. And I guess the question is, to what extent do you think the internet and social media have affected or perhaps exacerbated our inclination to prefer changing words before changing thoughts, insofar that it is quite easy, much easier and faster to disseminate these words throughout our culture with the use of these tools? You have said it all. I mean, the internet and particularly phones make it easier to disseminate those words, easier to disseminate the message that you should use the words, and it makes it easier to fall for the idea that the slow, often boring work of political change can be replaced by saying, now we're going to say it this way. Yeah, I don't think that this would happen so quickly and wouldn't be imposed so zestily if there was not the internet and if there were not the phones in particular. It's one of the ways that the phones transform existence. And the phones are great in many ways. But yeah, iPhones and tend to encourage a facile sense of what politics is. And I'm not sure how we get out of that, but yes, that is a, a major factor in this. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi there, my name is Cody. I am a senior here at CMC, and I'm dual majoring in philosophy and German. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that the words uh, seem to be become more uh, precise or restricted when it comes to our usage. Um, but I also seem to perceive an expansion when it comes to specifically pronouns as a connotation of things like gender identity have seemed to take a place next to its prior and single denotation of biological sex. Um, now I see people using what are called neo pronouns um, and posting guides of how to use things like frog frogs pronouns like frog self. Um, have there been any other relevant or pertinent examples of what I perceive to be the synthesis of connotation and denotations. And how is this maybe affecting our discourse right now as we say a word we know denotes X, but also might connote Y? Do you mean that we say that it might connote Y or that it actually does? Uh, that's a good question. I think when it comes to um, employing the principle of charity, it, it may muddy the waters as it could be both ways. <laughs> this is an interesting way of thinking of it, but I think truly, and this is a kind of a sloppy answer, pronouns are a place where there's very little room to maneuver. And so if you're trying to work with English in particular, where we have a rather impoverished set of pronouns, you can only work with what you have. And so to make up a new set of pronouns and say that this is going to be the denotation. It never works because pronouns sit so deeply in the brain. They are not words, they're impulses. And so you can't change them. They're not open to change. You can't add a new one. I am unaware of any language anywhere where a pronoun and truly a pronoun, not, you might understand this distinction, not a pronoun that really under syntactic analysis is a noun and means something like soldier, but just a pronoun with nothing but grammatical meaning. It, you can't add one. And so you have to use what you've already got. And of course, each pronoun has resonances that are not going to be under the dictionary definition, but still, people are very conservative about them. And that's why there's so much outcry about using they in the singular in any way at all. It's kind of a miracle that the new they has happened as quickly as it has, and I think part of that is also the phones. That's a benefit of the phones. But that was unusual, and for the most part, my next book is about pronouns, because I find all this interesting. For the most part, pronouns have a way of either just sitting still, or what they do doesn't make any sense. They drift in ways that are utterly confounding, such as thou and you. Thou is singular, you is plural, the disappearance of thou, which is a mystery that no one has ever solved why that happened in English. So yeah, pronouns are tough little things. That's the, the messy answer to your question. Perfect, thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, my name is Caleb. I'm a senior at CMC studying environmental science, economics, and politics. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is about whether um, the, ex the um, if you believe that social media has accelerated the ways in which um, the, the ways in which certain terms have evolved over time, 
especially through the lens of words that kind of stem from academia, such as like critical race theory or like psych psychological trauma, um, particularly in the ways that like social media has been able to like plateau this, this um, it's been like a way to plateau, uh, put people on the same level uh, of different economic, eh, excuse me, different academic or professional standing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think kind of a good example in my mind is like how now on social media, like it's like a pretty benign example, but like how people will like have like a TikTok that says like POV and then they'll just like be in the video. And like that's like a literary, kind of like a literary example of how um, like a literary term from academia was misrepresented and misconstrued by kind of like common people, I guess. Um, so do you think that <laughs> <laughs> do you yeah. think that social media can kind of be an accelerant of those types of dynamics with language? I think that it it definitely will. And so of course all of this intersects with what humor is and what irony is. But yes, words meanings change faster when yoked into something like that. Yeah. Once again, you've said it. Yeah, that is definitely the case. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rukmini. I'm a philosophy major at CMC and I'm a senior. Um, the question I have, I, I fear that it might be like a very woefully obvious one that I think like you might feel, but as someone who's very like unequipped and like linguistics, I think it's one that sort of rang through my mind the entire I time. I wanna hear this. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I guess like the fact that like, so for example, I also di don't like using BIPOC because in the language I speak at home, POC means fart. So it feels like I'm saying so bisexual parts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so <laughs> I'm personally not a fan of the term because of that association with it. Um, but like, I guess for me, something I wonder is even the fact that like that term has like peaked enough conversation, like does that not lend itself value to it? Um, so like from what I've heard, like the term originated because a lot of issues that were usually described as affecting people of color, it was sort of obscuring the fact that they especially tend to like marginalize like black and indigenous populations, hence why like the bi was added to the POC. Um, and so like, I do think that like, even the fact that that term has been invented, now we have like a greater kind of awareness when talking about those issues, I guess same with the term like they, or like even, I guess like Latine. I know that maybe not a lot of people use those terms, but I think even the fact that the conversation has opened up to talking about the experiences of like non-binary people or others who fall outside of the gender binary, at least to me, I do feel like that counts for something, but I guess like looking at it from like a linguistics perspective, do you feel like the backlash incited from those kind of terms sort of like, does it overshadow like any kind of conversation peaked by them? Or do you think perhaps the conversation would have been peaked nonetheless without those terms? Well, no, all of this is quite understandable. And yeah, there would not have been a BIPOC term at all in 1980. My only point about it is not that it's, I think that the term is especially clumsy for reasons like those. But suppose it wasn't. Suppose there was some pretty word that didn't have to do with intestines and, you know, and made, made sense. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it except that if it doesn't get around outside of campuses like this, then I question what its use is as social justice if it's only being talked about, if the issues are only being talked about in small circles. And so who is talking about this particular coalition? And I'm glad they're talking about it, but I would rather they make more people talk about it without saying we're gonna use this term that you've never heard of when most people don't wanna use new words anyway. So, but it's, it's okay, like let's say that the word were varana. I'm just making something up. It's it, varana. That's fine, but if only people only said varana on campuses and at the art center, I would just say, why not just talk about the issues? The issues are crucial. I'm just talking about the, the term. So yeah, but yeah. What language is that? I have to use this. Oh, um, Bengali. Okay, I'm gonna but, remember that. But the one spoken in India, not, I don't, oh, some the... dialects in Bangladesh is a different word, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, but Bengali's a big giant language, but okay, I'm just, I like to know these things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kendall. I'm a first year at Pomona studying economics. Um, and I guess I was wondering, um, years ago, we saw more of the nitpickiness of grammar and small linguistic things along the lines of like class and that kind of thing, and now we're seeing it mostly coming from the left. So I was wondering where you see it coming from five years from now, a decade, 50 years, just where this overall, I don't know, policing of language or ch like 
linguistic changes coming from in the future? You know, there are three things that I don't do. Sports, burritos, never had one. I don't, don't know what they are. And three, sci-fi. I have never been a sci-fi person. I don't get it. And that means that I don't think that way. I'm not great at, well, what is it going to be in, in 50 years? The leftist onslaught, there's going to be a pushback, and I would give it another 15 years. Who is going to be imposing language after that? There are going to be various unpredictable black swan events we can imagine. Kendall, I don't know. I'd have to... I'd have to think about that. Like, who's it going to come from? Will there be none of it? Maybe, but it depends on what's going on. I don't know the answer to that question. More people are going to be educating themselves from home in, say, 50 years. Our conception of college and where it fits in. I'm just, I'm going to fly blind here. And so, where would the terminology start coming from? Part of the classism will be the main, the people who are still going to university as opposed to the people who are using Wondrium and taking online courses at home. And so there's going to be, no, I can't find it. I'm giving you my honest, uh, I'll write a column about that one day. Just check, but I'd have to sit and, and drink and think about it. <laughs> Sorry. Please join me in once again thanking Professor John McWhorter. Thank you.